If you'd like to meet me in Psalm 101, that's where we will be today. Uh, this will be a very uh, practical, application-heavy um, devotion this morning, message. And uh, I'm, I've done something with this that I don't normally do. And I have made this a good old-fashioned three-point message. Um, I don't normally do that. And so this is, again... It will probably feel a little bit different, but I think that the psalm uh, sort of leads us to that. So let's read this together, and then we will walk through this. Psalm 101. I will sing of steadfast love and justice to you, O Lord. I will make music. I will ponder the way that is blameless. O, when will you come to me? I will walk with integrity of heart within my house. I will, not set my, I will not set before my eyes anything that is worthless. I hate the work of those who fall away. It shall not cling to me. A perverse heart shall be far from me. I will know nothing of evil. Whoever slanders his neighbor secretly, I will destroy. Whoever has a haughty look and an arrogant heart, I will not endure. I will look with favor on the faithful in the land, that they may dwell with me. He who walks in the way that is blameless shall minister to me. No one who practices deceit shall dwell in my house. No one who utters lies shall continue before my eyes. Morning by morning, I will destroy all the wicked in the land, cutting off all the evildoers from the city of the Lord. The most likely occasion for the composition of this psalm is shortly after the death of Saul. Now, a brief recap of what has taken place up to this point in the saga of the king of Israel. If you remember, uh, Saul was anointed king of Israel, but he would eventually, uh, through jealousy and envy, he would become the adversary of King David, um, who we have uh, many accounts of how Saul wronged David repeatedly, um, during his kingship. And so, as Saul was king, David was anointed to be the future king. Uh, David serves faithfully under Saul, um, but Saul, just over time, uh, continues to really seek to take David out um, uh, from an envious place, from a place of jealousy. Now, again, if you remember, um, King David was anointed king, uh, it serves Saul. This psalm is written in the time to where he is about to assume his uh, rightful place on the throne. So Saul eventually dies in battle. David is going to ascend to the throne. And this psalm is a statement of what kind of administration that David wanted to have as the king of Israel. And so David uh, declares that he is resolved to faithfully perform uh, his royal duties, uh, to justly govern as king, but probably more so, he vowed to be a true servant of God. This is a big moment, and David is looking at what is ahead of him, and he shows uh, the resoluteness um, of living a godly life and to rule with integrity. Uh, we see commitment, and we see pledge, and we see uh, promise. Uh, this is, in essence, a vow to live a holy life, uh, or godly life. And to say it differently, it actually reveals to us the starting point on how to, re how to cultivate a life that is centered around the person and the work of Christ. Uh, it's outlining both what he is committed to and what he rejects. So what we see in the psalm is he commits to walking with integrity. He commits to not setting his eyes on anything meaningless, uh, to not be entertained by anything that is worthless or what is vile. He commits to having a, 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 a heart that perseveres and that a perverse heart be far from him. Uh, he refuses to be in relationship with someone who is inclined to disobedience. He commits to know nothing of evil. 
He commits to dealing with individuals who slander and are haughty and are arrogant. He commits to look favorably on those who walk upright uh, and to be on the lookout for uh, faithful men to be in his company. And he commits to not permit dishonesty and deceit to stand before him. Now we'll get to the place in a little bit to where David doesn't necessarily at all times in his kingship live into this. We'll get there in a moment. But David's purpose is to guard his own heart and to protect the nation from the influences of evil. And we'll see that at the end of this psalm. And so Psalm 101 reveals to us um, that living a life of integrity, living a godly life, pursuing holiness, it doesn't just happen. And so through the treasure that we have in front of us, uh, I'm going to use this text to reveal some practical truths uh, that must be present in the life of someone who seeks to live a godly life. Now, uh, before we get into the thick of this, just a quick reminder that I want to keep in front of all of us. Uh, scripture is very clear that God is the one who enables our growth and holiness. But Scripture is also equally clear that we are to battle against sin and to battle against our flesh, and that we must run our race and that we need to do so with endurance. Uh, all of our growth is not a work that we can do on our own. It is completely a work of God. And so keep that in mind as we are walking through and studying this text. So David's example reveals to us some uh, resolutions, if you will. Uh, to live a godly life. So I want to set these up in a few different categories. Here's the three-point sermon uh, coming at you fast. Here's number one. Live a consistent life. Uh, David was determined to live a wise and holy life. And he was determined that his reign as king would be marked with uh, integrity and godliness. And so we see something pretty telling uh, in verse 2. David says, I will ponder the way that is blameless. Oh, when will you come to me? I will walk with integrity of heart within my house. Uh, David begins with himself. Uh, David is committed to bringing his own character and conduct into conformity with the way and the will of the Lord. And the commitments to purify the heart uh, in our lives uh, can only begin in our house. Uh, they can only begin in the place where you are your true self, with no facade, no veneer, no disguise, no pretense, uh, the place where you are who you really are, and to where your commitments are truest and your pursuits are candid and, and plain. Uh, you know, when we think about our lives and we think about really uh, the witness of our lives, it is one thing to make these commitments to uphold some reputation or claim. It's another to make these commitments for the sake of living a holy life. Uh, it's one thing to just say that you are the way that you are and to walk the way that you walk and to uh, make these proclamations of what you are convicted of. It's another to actually live into those to do what we're called to do, which is to glorify God. And so we have to be intentional in all places at all times to live a life that pleases God, to live a life that is deliberate in following the Lord, a life that honors God, a life whose pursuit is Christ. Because for those who are truly in Christ and have received the hope of salvation through Christ and Christ alone, if we truly set our hearts and our minds on this hope, then we will live accordingly. Now, we won't do this perfectly, um, but we seek to obey the Lord in all things. And it's in our obedience that we demonstrate and reveal that the Lord is actively and continually sanctifying us, uh, making us more and more like His Son. I like how John Calvin sort of wrapped this up. He so pointedly said, As even the most perfect are always very far from coming up to the mark, we ought daily to strive more and more, 
And we ought to remember that we are not only told what our duty is, but God also adds, I am He who sanctifies you. As the old adage goes, if it looks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck. And so it really draws us to consider, does your life leave your supposed claim in question? If you claim to have submitted yourself to the Lordship of Christ, does your life look that way? It's one thing for us to consider. Now, just because I, I always have to give a little sidebar, I'm, I'm not talking about quirks and temperaments, personality, uh, the uniqueness that each one of us possesses. I've shared many times, uh, my wife often asks me, Jared, are you having a good time? Yeah, great time, great. Then tell your face, you know. Um, I'm not talking about the different personalities. Um, we must be careful that we don't equate authentic Christianity with likableness or charm or personality preference. Uh, I'm talking about considering what is consistently produced in the life of a person. Is there evidence of the Lord working in them and through them? And are they persistent in their pursuit of the Lord? So we must pursue, we must resolve to live consistently both in public and in our own house. Number two, we must then resolve to watch what we accommodate. Uh, in the previous verses, David shared what he is committed to doing. Now David shares what he is committed to not doing. Uh, David commits to cultivate a heart of integrity uh, rather than cultivating a heart that craves evil. He says in verse 3 and 4, I will not set before my eyes anything that is worthless. I hate the work of those who fall away. I shall not cling to me. It shall not cling to me. A perverse heart shall be far from me, and I will know nothing of evil. Uh, to live a life of integrity, to live a godly life, to live a life that pleases the Lord, we must keep distance from all that threatens to pull us away from that commitment. Uh, worthless things, evil things, uh, realities that are not edifying or useful, uh, that which steals our time and demands uh, more of us than we have to give, uh, trappings that make promises that they cannot fulfill. David resolved to not even set his eyes on these things. And that's really interesting. Remember earlier I told you about what would happen later on in David's life. He commits to not setting his eyes on these things, but later on in, this, in his life, this would not be the case, uh, particularly in his sin with Bathsheba. Um, but I think what that shows us uh, is the necessity of keeping careful watch over what we set before our eyes. David, if he was where he was supposed to be, would not have been in that situation. His gaze was a little too long. And it probably was, bit, was even longer than just that moment or the longer than that circumstance. But I think it shows us the necessity of keeping watch over what we accommodate and what we set our eyes on. Here's another example in the book of Job, in chapter 31 and verse 1. Just an interesting statement. The principle still applies. Uh, in his final appeal to God, he speaks of what David is proclaiming in this psalm. Job says, I've made a covenant with my eyes. How then could I gaze at a virgin? Discipline over the eyes is a primary measure of godliness. Uh, keeping watch over what we gaze upon is critical to keeping our commitments. And if we were to take honest inventory of our lives, we all welcome worthless things and evil things into our lives more than we think. We accommodate that which tramples on our commitments. We compromise we yield and we concede and we give them space to run free in our lives. The truth is that each one of us in this room have a lot to learn about choosing to attend to what will encourage our pursuit 
of godliness rather than what will hurt it. And we have to pay close attention to that. And we must resolve to watch what we accommodate. So live a consistent life, watch what we accommodate. And here's the third. David resolves to watch the company that he keeps. He says, whoever slanders his neighbor secretly, I will destroy. Whoever has a haughty look and an arrogant heart, I will not endure. David is committed to surrounding himself with godly people. Uh, what David has resolved to live up to up to this point in his life is also applied to the company that he keeps. So the standard that he has for himself is also the standard that he has for those who surround him that will help govern the people. In verse 5, he describes the kind of company he will not keep. Slanderers, the arrogant, the prideful. And then in verse 6 and 7, we see the company that he is committed to surrounding himself with. We see those who David will receive counsel from, and it's those who value what he values. Uh, one of the things that I love about what we get to do here is that we are all like-minded. And so if you've ever wondered why you're excited to come to work, maybe not every day, but most days, is because you're surrounded by individuals who value what you value, who love what you love, and are going after what you're going after. And this is what David shows us here. Uh, David has his eyes alert for the faithful in the land, uh, for those individuals that he wanted to serve with him. The godly, the faithful, and the committed were those that he would appoint to his government. And so if we as individuals are, are committed to the pursuit of holiness and to live a godly life, we must consider our company. Now, one of the greatest assets in the pursuit of holiness is the people of God. Um, I've learned this uh, throughout my years in ministry. I was a young pastor, and the people that I surrounded myself with was really important. Well, that's one of the greatest gifts that God gives to us is other people. And we would be found wise to surround ourselves with other Christ followers who are committed to helping us grow in Christ-likeness. David knew that if he wanted to rule his kingdom with godly statutes, he needed to surround himself with those who deeply valued those statutes as well. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, we are advised, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. It is the nature of sin to entangle and to trip us up and to drag us down. If our company is enmeshed in sin and tolerant of sin, we're exposed to its entangling influence. Uh, like Eve in the garden, we are easily enticed to disobey God through the snake-like influence of bad company. Now, I know that that sounds like a message for young people. I really get that. But that's a message for all of us. To watch the company that we keep is critical in our pursuit of the Lord. And so it's a sign of great maturity uh, when you break up with bad company. Uh, and we cannot be slow in doing so. If the company simply feeds this beast for the need of entertainment in your life, if it doesn't move you towards godliness, it's a liability. And you can become easily entrenched uh, in that sin. And so one of the greatest deposits that you can make into your growth in Christ is to keep close watch on the company that you keep. Live a consistent life, watch what you accommodate, and be aware and look at the company that you keep. Now the final clause of this psalm is rather emphatic. Uh, David knew that he was under sacred obligation. Um, not to act faithfully as king would not only have been a tragedy for his kingdom, 
but he would be committing treason against the Lord. And so in the beginning of this psalm, uh, David commits himself to God's standards and God's mercies. And then the result is seen in the closing clause. We really see his, his goal. And it's to present the city of the Lord holy and pleasing to God. That David will rule according to his loyalty to the Lord and not the ways of the world. He says, morning by morning, I will destroy all the wicked in the land, cutting off all the evildoers from the city of the Lord. So in a much deeper sense, David's commitment to rule his kingdom with integrity is to present his kingdom worthy of its true king. David's vow wasn't to glorify his kingdom and his kingship. It was to bring glory to God. He wanted to lead in a way that would glorify God. The first question uh, of the work known as the Westminster Catechism, uh, it's, it's acknowledged as one of the most accurate and succinct summaries of the Christian faith, is what is the chief end of man? And that's not like an open-ended question to where we get to, you know, there's an answer to it. And the answer is man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. And so we resolve to live a godly life and a holy life and a life pleasing to God for God's glory. Not so people look at us. Not so people depend on us. Not so people give us attaboys. Not so that people affirm us. We resolve to live a life of integrity we resolve to live a godly life. We, we, we walk through the process of sanctification to the glory of God. And that's what David is saying in this psalm. And so we live a consistent life. And there's more than this, but just to wrap it up, we watch what we accommodate and we watch the company we keep to the glory of God. It's not just that you'd be exposed it's not just that you'd be called a hypocrite. It's not just that you'd be embarrassed. You live your life in such a way that brings glory to God. That is the chief end of man. And so my prayer is that through this psalm, you would begin to see um, our role in this life. And you would see the commitments that we are called to keep. So let us pray together. Father, thank you for your grace. Thank you, Lord, for your constant work in our lives that is conforming us to your likeness. Although at times it is painful and hard, we know that it is for our benefit. And so I ask you, Lord, that as we uh, go to do the work you set before us today, uh, that we would be mindful of your work in our lives, uh, that we would be reminded of uh, the sanctification that is taking place in each one of us, and may we remember what our chief end is, and it is to glorify you and to enjoy you forever. Would you be with us this day, Lord? Uh, we love you, and we thank you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.